Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions about the um, Q project? If you do, I have a vote. I think it's, can we delay those until the beginning of lab? Does that sound like a reasonable thing to do? Okay. Um, so where are we now at this point? We are talking about lists. Okay. And at the very outset, there's something that is going to be sort of confusing. If you read this, it may have confused you. It says, as there is a list is a collection of items where each holds a relative position with respect to the others. And it's called an unordered list. And then they go and say, well, we have a first item, second item, third item. And so, well, there's the order, right? Okay, I don't know if that confused you. The problem is they're using the word unordered in two different meanings. For example, a hash map is unordered in the sense that, oh, let me move this up a little bit so you can see it better. Um, that there is no um, first item or next item. And the same with a set. Okay, you have a set of numbers and there's no, the, nothing that I can distinguish as, oh yes, this is the first item in the set. There just isn't, there, it's just a set. And when we talk about an unordered list, we are saying that the values are in no particular order. Okay, so a list does have a specific first item, second item, etc. Okay, but the values in those items don't have to be in ascending or descending order. So I can have like 45, and then the next item is going to be a 37, and then the one after that is going to be an 89, and then a 22, and then a 29. Okay. There's a first item, a next item, the one after that. But again, there's no specific, the values are not in order. Okay. So that, that's sort of a, a, a minor confusion that I was looking at, wait a minute. You said it's not ordered and there's a first item. How can that be? They're referring to the values here. Yeah. yeah. So the things that we can do with the list, we can create an empty one. We're going to add an item and you're going to have to tell what item to add. Now, this, I'm not going to have to say they assume the item is not already in the list. What they have here in the book, they said, presume that there are no duplicates. Turns out that everything we're going to do here works just fine, whether there are duplicates or not. You don't have to change any of the code. So I'm not sure why the book says this, and I'm giving some thought as to lifting that restriction because it really doesn't make a difference. Um, removes an item. This says throw an exception if the item is not present in the list. I'm going to change that also. This was, a, I wrote that part and that was a mistake. What it's going to do is move an item. If the item's not present in the list, then the list just doesn't change. When we had a stack and we tried to pop from an empty stack, that's definitely an error condition. Okay, we definitely want to warn people, hey, you can't pop an empty stack. But if you try to remove something from a list and it's not in there, there's no reason to crash the program. We may as well just say, oh, well, it wasn't there, so no, no harm, no foul. Okay. And in fact, the code I'm going to show you is going to lift that restriction also. So if the item's not present in the list, it just leaves the list untouched. Search searches for an item, and it gives you back a true or a false. It's yes, it was in the list. No, it wasn't. Uh, checks to see if a list is empty. We want to know how many items there are in the list. Um, we want to be able to append something to the end of the list. Um, find where it is in the list. So if I have this list here, and I want to find out where the 89 is, that would be at position 2, because we're going to index everything starting at 0. That's just the way... The you know, computer people love counting at zero. We'd like to be able to insert an item at a given position. So it's a lot like an array list, except we're not going to use an array list as the backing 
data structure for this. We're going to use a completely different data structure to represent our linked list. And we'd like to be able to pop, which removes and returns the last item. And we'd also like to be able to pop out something in the middle of the list by its position number. Now, these append, index, insert, pop, and, and, and the pop methods are not going to be something I'm going to show you the implementation of today because that happens to be part of an assignment. So we're going to concentrate on adding, removing, and searching for items. Uh, hold on a second. I just need to check to see if I have a message in the chat window. Okay, good. Okay, so we're going to have what's called a linked list. So instead of an array where everything is contiguous in memory, um, do I need to draw a picture of this? Yes, I do. Let's stop sharing and let's try, um, so when we have an array or an array list, everything is right together in memory. If you were to look at the memory addresses for 17, 38, 22, they would be one after the other. In a linked list, we're going to have them in memory. We have the 17, our 38, our 22, and the 89. And what we're going to do is we're going to have what's um, a reference to where we find the next one. And the 38 will have a reference to where to find the 22. And the 22 will have a reference to where to find the 89. And the 89 is going to have a symbol that says there's nothing more in the list. So these could be anywhere in memory instead of contiguous. That's the difference between an array and a linked list. We're also going to have to have one special um, reference called the head of the list that tells where to find the first item. So that's the difference between this array and this linked list. We have links that you can sort of like, if they're all tied together with a rope, you can follow the rope to get to the next person in line. Where's my share screen? And in fact, that's what they have here. And so what we're going to need is something called a node. Each one of these things that I drew up on the board is a node, and it contains the data and a reference to the next node that's in the list. And this symbol here, this is what's called the electrical. If you, if anybody, if you've ever done stuff with electrical engineering or electricity, that's a symbol for ground, which means connected to ground means that's the end of the circuit. Okay, and we're using that symbol to indicate this is the end of the list when we draw a picture of it. This is not the way I was taught it when I was in university, but that doesn't matter. Any symbol will do. Um, let's take a look at the node class. Do they have, we have this here? Uh, da -da -dum. Oh, okay. I mean, it'll just show, I'll, I'll show you the code for it here. So here we have a node, and again, we're gonna use generics here. So we can have a linked list of integers, a linked list of strings, a linked list of double, or any kind of object that we like. So we're going to have the data, that's the actual thing stored in the node, and we're going to have, and this is sort of weird. This is the first time you've ever seen something like this, I suspect. The next is a reference to another node. So we have a node that refers to itself. Isn't that sort of weird? but it all works, okay? it'll all work out just great. And then when we wanna create a new node, we give it the data item, and because we haven't put it into a list yet, we're going to say there is no next node. It's just gonna be a node floating out in the middle of nowhere. And we need our getters and setters um, to get the data, and we also need our getters and setters to set the next 
And we also have a two string and two string is going to just tell us what the data node looks like. The data value, excuse me, looks like. So there that is. This is interesting. So now let's look at our unordered list. You know what I'm going to I'm going to um, move over to to I'm, I'm going to move over to Genie at this point I think. So here's our unordered list, and this is really sort of weird. Again, again, there's a lot of weirdness here. Saying, well, because when we had the stack, for example, we had to have an array list for all the entries, right? And here we've only got one entry, which is where does the list begin? That's okay because once we know where the list begins. We have a, a reference to the head of the list. That head of the list is going to have a next value that will lead us to the next item in the list. And that node will also have another one that will lead us to the next item in the list. So to represent the list itself, the only thing we really need to have is where does this begin? And when we have an um, create an unordered list, we're going to set it to null, which means that's an empty list. And then we're going to have a getter and setter for that. So now the question is, how can I tell if a list is empty? And the answer is, if the head of the list is null, that means there's nothing in the list. Um, here. Again, so I'm going to presume that we have a list already. Okay, so let's say we're looking at this list. My list, the head is pointing to 14. The 14 refers to the 22. The 22 leads us to 37. 37 leads us to 56. And the grounding symbol means there ain't no more. Hmm? So everybody okay with that? Yes. So now the question is, how do I add a node and the Best way to add a node to a linked list is to add it at the head because that's the fastest thing to do. So we're going to create a new node, 89. And that's going to become the new head of the list. We're going to set the next of the new node to refer to the current head. Remember, the current head of the list is 14. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create this new node and say, okay, the next guy after the 89 is going to become what used to be the head of the list. Then we'll change the head of the list to go to our new node. And now we have 89 added to our list at the beginning. So when we add to a linked list, we're going to add at the beginning, not at the end. And this is an order one operation. It's constant time doesn't matter how many things there are in the list after the head. All I'm doing is moving the head pointer to go to my new item. Now, you got to be careful. Let's go back to the previous. Um, this step two and three, you have to do them in this order. If you do it in the wrong order, watch what happens. So here's the wrong way. I'm going to create a note. I have to do that first. Now, what happens if I say, okay, I'm going to set the head to be my new node. Okay, now, because this had nothing in it, it's, how do I get to these? All of a sudden, I have no way to get to those nodes anymore. And that's why when we do the add, we have to make sure that we create the node, link up the new node to the existing list, and then the last thing we do is change the head of the list to point to where we want to go. I'm using the word point um, rather loosely here. Anybody here um, programming C or C++? Okay, when you do, um, if you ever do learn C and C++, they're going to call, have something called pointers. And that's not the same as what I'm using here. I'm using the word pointer in, as a loosely instead of the word reference. Okay, but they're not quite the same thing. So all you C and C++ people, yeah, anybody who's listening to the Zoom section session later, 
when I say pointer, think reference, because that's what it really is. Okay, and here's um, add. So add doesn't take a heck of a lot. I'm going to create a new node with the item that I want. And I'm going to make that a temporary variable. I'll set its next reference to refer to the current head of the list. And now the head of the list becomes this new node that I just created. Now, question is, what happens if I want to add something to an empty list? Is this going to be a special case? And this is something I see with beginning programmers or even advanced programmers sometimes. They say, oh, the list is empty. I'm going to need an if statement. I'm going to have to do something absolutely, totally different because it's an empty list. Like, oh, the, this, this, this is da danger zone ahead. Before you write a special case, let's go through the algorithm and check to see if we really need to have an if statement for empty lists or if what we said before still works. So we have our empty list here. We're going to create a node. We're going to set the next of the new node to be their head. And the head of the list was referring to the, the, the empty list. And therefore, 89 has nothing after it. And step three is set the head to refer to the new node. Hey, it worked. So the answer is no. There's nothing special about adding to an empty list. The code that we have here is going to work just fine. Something I forgot to say when I was looking at this code is this grounding symbol here. That's very nice for us when we're drawing pictures of this. What are we going to use to represent it? And the answer is that that's what the, is going to be our grounding symbol. When we see the null reference, that means it's not referring to anything at all, which means that must be the end of the list. So we're going to be using null to represent the end of the list. And again, this is in constant time. Doesn't matter how many items there are in the list, it's the same number of operations if you decide you're gonna add at the head of the list because that's the easiest place to do it. What if we wanna find out how many elements there are in a linked list? Okay. And here's the code for it. We're going to set the current node to be the same as the head of the list. And then we're going to set our count to zero. Now what we're going to do is, as long as the current is not equal to null, and it certainly isn't at this point, we're going to add one to the count. So count now becomes one. And then we move on to the next item in the list. We come back to our while loop. Current is definitely not equal to null, so we've added one to our count. And then we go on to the next. Now we ask, is current not equal to null? It definitely isn't, so our count becomes three. And then we go current becomes current.next, which is now the null entry. We come up here, current is equal to null. That drops us out of our loop, and we return the count. And indeed, there are three items. So this um, algorithm is order n. It's linear. It depends on how many items there are in the list. Now, next question is, is counting the size of an empty list a special case? And when we have an empty list, do we have to do something different? How many people think we're going to have to do something different? How many people think we're not going to have to do anything different? Okay. How many people aren't sure? Okay. The way we do it is, well, let's go through the algorithm and see what it produces. If it produces the right result, great. We don't have to change anything. If it produces the wrong result, then it looks like we do have a special case. Okay, okay we're going to set the current to be the head of the list. We're going to set the counter to zero. Um, I didn't put count current in here. Hold on. Let me edit these slides here a little bit here. Sorry about that. Let's go here. Let's grab this. Uh, yeah, not that much. Copy that. Oh, great. I don't remember which slide I was on. <laughs> I, knew, I knew this was going to happen at some point. Um, Okay. 
So we've set the current to be the head of the list. We'll set the count to zero. Current not equal to null fails. So we drop out of the while loop and return the count, which is zero. Yeah, an empty list has zero in it. So it turns out that no, this is not a special case either. You know, whenever you think, oh, maybe I need to do something different, try it without doing something different. See if it works. If it works, great. You're home free. If it doesn't work, okay, well, looks like you do have to put in an if statement somewhere. And we're going to get to one of those later on today. Now, what if I want to search for a particular item inside of a linked list? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to set, uh, see here. So here's my linked list at the moment. And I'm going to set the current to be the head of the list. I'll just start there. It's not null. Let's look at the data there. The data is 89. And let's say I'm looking for 22. So I'm looking for the 22 here. Well, 89 certainly is not equal to 22. So I'll go and set current to the next value in the list. Current is not equal to null. Uh, current dot get data equals item. That's correct. 14 is not equal to 22. So I move on to the next item. That's not null, so there's still more to do. Aha, this time it is equal to item, and therefore I'm going to return true and I'm going to exit from the um, algorithm. By the way, um, notice that they have, well, let's go back here to the previous one. They have a return true, oh, shoot, can't click on that. They have a return true here and a return false. And this is, there's nothing wrong with this, okay? I, I'm not a big fan of having um, two return statements. There's a school of thought. I might as well put this in here in the notes. That every method should have one entry point and one exit point. So having multiple return statements in a method gives you multiple possible points of failure. Okay. This is just a guideline, not a command. <laughs> uh, my personal preference is if I can get by without multiple return statements, that's what I'll do. And in fact, um, by using a compound condition, you can make this happen. I'm going to say as long as the current is not equal to the null pointer, if I'm not at the end, and I still haven't found the one that I'm looking for, I'll go and get the next item. So I'm going to get out of this either when I hit the end of the list or when I find the thing I'm looking for. If any one of those things gets false, then I drop out of my loop. And then I can return whether the current is the null pointer or not. If the current is not the null pointer, I must have found it. If the current is the null pointer, that means I got to the end of the list without finding it, and I can return false. So I've got one return statement. So this is a little bit more elegant code. Whether it's more readable, I don't know. Okay. This one you might need to think about to see why it works. Whereas this one, it's fairly clear why it works and why it doesn't. I'm um, looking at the actual code that I wrote for it here. Is, oh no, search is fine. Never mind. <laughs> search gives you back a true or false. It's the same code. Yeah, And I use the return true and return false rather than the compact version. Mostly because I think that's what they did in the original book. But the point still stands. If you want to, you can use a compound condition. And you may want to trace this through step by step to see that it actually works. Now, removing an item. Okay, adding an item, that's fairly straightforward. We put it at the beginning. No big deal. Uh, finding an item. We have to go and search until we find it or until we hit the end. By the way, that's going to be order n. 
because best case we find it immediately, worst case we have to run all the way to the end of the loop and there's n items, the longer the list, the longer it's gonna take us. Ah, uh, removing an item, that's gonna be a bit tricky. So let's say I wanna get remove the 22 from this list. This is what I wanna end up with when I'm done. Yeah. And the question is, well, I can take the 14 and the 14 is going to have to link into the 56, correct? Yeah. But if all I have is the current node, then how do I get to the 14? All I can get to from 22 is the 56. I can't get back to the 14. Do you see the problem? It's like, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm on 22, but I've lost my link to 14. And so now I'm out of luck. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pull a sneaky trick. We're going to have a previous and a current. We're going to say, what is the previous item? And we're also going to have to tell which one's our current item. So we're going to have to keep two references now, not just one. So right now we're going to have, um, have the current is going to be the head of the list. And there is no previous item. When you're at the head of the list, there's nothing before that. Yeah. Now, current is definitely not null at this point, and we haven't found our item. Let's say we're, we're going to be removing the 22 here. That means we're going to have to set the previous to be our current value, and then we can move on. Those have to be in the correct order, by the way. If you reverse those, then you're screwed up, because if you move on to the next pointer, then all of a sudden, again, you've lost your link, and the previous can't get updated. So we have to update the previous value first to catch up with our current pointer. And then we can move the current reference onwards to the next link. Um, I'm going to go through the next step. I've moved them on here again. Current is not null. And I, but this time I have found the item. And and that means I drop out of the loop. Because the current is not null, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the next pointer from the previous item to be the next pointer of current. Remember, current referred to 56. Yes, it linked to 56. That means the previous now has to link to 56. 22 no longer gets involved in the list. It's now out of the list completely, and I think the garbage collector will pick it up for us. If something is not in the list at all, then it will leave the list untouched. It will not generate an error. So here's what the, here's the, let me review this here. There's three parts to this. We have to initialize everything. That's these two lines here. In fact, let's go here. Um, let me see if I can. Excuse me, I need to. Sorry, I need to move this around here. Can you read that? Um, that can you read the code, or do you need me to make it larger? Is that okay by the way it is? Yeah. So we have three parts to this. The first one part is to initialize everything. The next part is to find where the item that we want to remove is. Once we have found it, namely, if the current is not equal to null, then we can take the next pointer of this current one and that now becomes the previous item's next link. So we initialize, find the item, and then update the values. Now, what about deleting the first node? It turns out this is a special case. Yeah. Right now, we've found it immediately. So we've dropped out of our loop, our, our search loop, because we found, found everything at, at the beginning, yes? 
What we can't say is we can't set previous dot set next. This line here is not going to work for us because there is no previous. It doesn't have a next link on in it, do we? Does it? So in the case that we're deleting the first node and we we have to do is we're going to have to say, put the head of the list to be the first node's next value. So that will take the head will become 14 and it still has no previous. There's still no previous pointer because we're still at the head of the list. So yes, and this time we do have a special case and that's why we needed an if statement here. Um, unlike what the book says, okay, on this remove, it's not going to throw an exception. I put that in there and that was just a bad design decision. I'm going to change the book and it will probably get updated online sometime at the beginning of next week. Okay, but for right now, get. Do I need to explain why I made that decision? Would that be a good thing to explain? Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, so why did I decide to leave a list unchanged if attempting to remove an item that doesn't exist? Yeah. Well, first thing was because... Um, it's really not a fatal error, like trying to pop an empty stack. Mm -hmm. And second, the code as given in the book, I think it would, uh, no, it did it, okay. Might have uh, produced inconsistent results with an empty stack, uh, empty list. Okay. And this was my the main motivation was um, item one. Okay, if somebody tries to remove something that doesn't exist in a list, now it depends on what implementation you have. It turns out that when you have linked list, the one that's built into Java, if you try and remove an item that's not in there, it will give you um, an error, I believe. Okay, so it's uh, it's up to the implementer, and I just decided. Also, by the way, yeah, there was a third thing. Um, just realized what my thing is. Simplifies the code. There's less code that I have to worry about, <laughs> which which is which is a powerful motivator. Excuse me, I just need to check something real quick here. The other professor who's usually here might be um, messaging me. Okay, good. Yeah, he was messaging me. Fine. Um, so that's why I changed it from what's in the book. If we look in the book here, in fact, I may as well look in the book and show you what it had before. It's a, if we get to the end of the list without finding it, I would throw a no such element exception and say it's not in the list. Okay, that's it just isn't necessary. It really isn't. Okay, but uh, deleting the first node in a list is still a special case. Whether you decided to throw an exception or not, if you're deleting the first one, you have to do something different because there is no previous item to relink. Um, question, will it work properly when we're deleting the last item? Yeah. Well, let's think what's going to happen here. We're going to set the next link for previous to be the same as the next link for the current. Next link for the current is the end of the list. And since we're deleting the last item, 56 will refer to the empty, to, to null, which means 56 is now the end of the list. So the answer is this is not a special case. Deleting at the beginning of a linked list is special. Deleting at the end works exactly the same and there's no difference. And wow, I got through this a lot faster than I thought I would. And so with, I have a lab that you can do that's sort of in preparation for um, 
the real lab. So I may as well talk about what the real assignment is, and then I'll talk about this one here. Namely, write a remove all method that removes all the occurrences of an item. So if you have, let's say 14 is in here twice, and I want to remove 14, this is what I'll end up with in the list. This will be a, you can write it in a linear fashion. I Yesterday I was, I, I was um, just sort of d driving to someplace and it hit me that there's a way to do it that's really sneaky and really simple code, but it's quadratic. <laughs> so if you do it the easy way, it's really inefficient. Um, if you have to do a lot of, a little bit of thinking, but you can do it in linear time. So you don't have to do a quadratic version. If anybody wants to see the quadratic version, which is just really awful, I'll I'll let you know about it. I was so happy with myself. Wow, I found something, a really inefficient way to do this. How cool. Um, so here's the assignment that you're going to have for, the, for lists, unordered lists. And by the way, on Wednesday, I'm going to talk about ordered lists. And that is not going to take a lot of time. So we're going to have a lot of time for lab on Wednesday. Um, remember, I was saying that there were some methods that we had not implemented in the unordered list class. So you're going to have unordered lists. These are going to be your starting point. You're going to have to write the append to add a new item to the end of the list, which will make it the last item in the collection. And it needs the item, it returns nothing. And you can allow duplicate items in the list. If it's already in the list, it doesn't matter. Just add it to the end. Um, notice that this means that you're going to have, this is going to be order n. Why? Because to get to the end of a list, you have to go through every single item up to and not including up to the last one. And by the way, I just gave you the algorithm for it. Namely, traverse the list until you hit the null and then create your new node and fix up the links. I'll let you worry about fixing up the links. Index returns the position of the first occurrence of the item in the list. If it's not in the list, it'll return a negative one. That's gonna share a lot of the code with search, isn't it? So as we search, we're gonna to have to keep track of what our index number is. If we get to the end of the list and there's nothing there, then we return a negative one. Right, am I going to write these down as pseudocode for you? No, not at the moment. If there's a if there's a if there's a gigantic popular demand, I might write down the pseudocode for these. Um, insert adds a new item at the list of a given position which means we have to count our position as we traverse the list. Um, if you say, I want to add at a negative position or something greater than the number of items, then that's definitely out of bounds. Okay, so it's like trying to add something to an array list at location negative five. Well, there is no negative five in an array list. Or if I have 10 items and I want to add at position 15, that's, no, that's definitely going to be someplace where I want an error. I don't want to just leave the list unchanged. By the way, if you give me the position that equals the length of the list, it'll do the same as append. Uh, pop will remove and return the last item. So again, you're gonna have to figure out where the last item is. By the way, insert is gonna be order n, pop is gonna be order n, and pop at a given position is order n in worst case. Why? Because we have to go through until we find the position, and that depends upon the length of the list. This part takes a lot of thinking because I have to figure out, okay, how do I get my links set up so that my next link to the next node in the list really is correct? So there's a lot of thinking that has to go on here, a lot of planning. This is incredibly mechanical. You're going to write a program in a file called test unordered list, and it's going to have a main method that's going to do these things. It's going to append an item to a list that has elements in it, append an empty list, try to find an element that exists. Notice it's going to test all of these things that you've just written. 
and you you're just gonna have to write a lot of things that create a list and okay and da, 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 da. this is how do you say it's very mechanical a lot of this is just building the list calling your method printing the results and seeing if it worked or not yeah. and there's just a lot of tests there's not a lot of analysis to, to be done um but you might take more physical clock time to write each list, each, each item. And then um, you'll upload the modified unordered list and your test unordered list Java files. Okay, don't upload node.java. I have that already. In fact, don't, you must not make any changes to node.java. Don't just say, I'm well, I'm just, I'll just put everything in node.java and fix it that way. No, that's not it. You're going to be changing unordered list.java. Um, the test unordered list, yeah, I need to see that because you're writing that from scratch. Yeah. Um, let's go here to our modules. And by the way, I forgot to say, need to check when that's due. It's due on uh, March 22nd, okay? So it's due 11 days from now. It's due after the um, Q project. And here's the remove all instance in the unordered list.java file. It's going to be a void method. doesn't have to return anything. Um, that's probably. I was going to do, I was going to make another design decision and I was going to change my mind, but no, at this point, no, changing my mind is not a good plan. So it's going to take uh, an item of the generic type T as this argument, and it'll remove all instances of the item from the list. So let's say I add 50, 77, 46, 77, 19, and 38. Notice because I'm adding at the head of the list, 38 is going to be the first item. The head is going to be always, the, it's going to be in reverse order, so to speak. And then after I remove 77, all occurrences of it, that's what should be in the list. It's not going to return a new list. It's going to change the linked list to reflect the, the remove. Um, I've given you the beginning point for your unordered list, your node, and the test remove all. And in fact, let's go here and let's look at those. Um, well, we've seen node and the other one. Here's test remove all. First of all, I'm, I, I I'm created a utility routine for you called make unordered list. You give it an array, and then it will... Um, add them into the list in reverse order so that the list has the same apparent order as the original array. Remember, we're a little lightly adding at the head, not at the end of the list, and therefore everything looks reversed. I've also done a utility routine here for you. It takes an unordered list, shows what it was before. You'll have to uncomment this line once you start doing your actual implementation and then it'll show you the after version of it and then it'll do an extra line for readability yeah. and then here i have my tests so i have let's say i want to get rid of orange so i have um i'm going to call make an unordered list with purple orange red orange blue orange yellow and then I'll print out which test it is, and then I'll call before and after. Now there's my list, and there's the thing I want to remove, and it will get removed there. This this having this utility routine here is going to save me a lot of duplicated code. And then here I have orange um, is at the the um, middle and at the end of the list. I want to check to see that that works. I want to check that I can remove something from the beginning and the middle. 
because there's the different kinds of things that could cause a problem. What if the thing I want to remove is at the beginning and end? And what if I have something that's at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end, in all three positions? Will my algorithm still work? And finally, I want to remove orange from a list that doesn't have orange in it at all. And does that work? So this is the kind of tests I will make. Oh, by the way, having these two methods here to make an unordered list and to do a before and after, that might be really useful for the actual assignment. Because you're going to have to be making a whole bunch of unordered lists. You're going to have to be doing the same sort of thing to all of the calling them um whoa i take that back this one is definitely useful this one here not so much because there's a construct that, that would be absolutely perfect for this and we haven't learned it yet unfortunately okay i was i, I was getting ahead of myself so at least you were going to have a, making the unordered list is going to be a lot easier. Doing the actual tests, maybe not so much. Okay, you might have to have a lot of duplicated code. And there's nothing I can do about that right now. Sorry about that. So that's it for the lecture. I presume that during lab time, you'll probably want to continue with the Q project. So let me answer, open it up to what questions do you have about the Q project right now? Is there any burning question that you have that you'd like me to try and answer? Hmm? Oh, um, you mean, was that the question you asked me about online about when you have two lists with the shortest? No? Okay, then what was, okay. A question came up earlier about what if I have on the shortest queue store where you enter the shortest queue, what if I have, let's say, the shortest queue is length seven, but there are three stations that all have length seven, which one do they go to? Okay, do you go to the first one, the second one, the, the last one, or choose at random? And the answer is, I don't care. Make whatever decision you want to, just document it. But you have a different question, yes? Hmm? Okay. Um, I did give you the. Yeah. Okay. You you might want to do, do. Do you want to see the pseudocode for it? Okay. I did write the pseudocode here. And so let's we presume that we have again. This is for the queue where you're entering the shortest, shortest line. So if I have a queue that's shorter than the current minimum, then we're going to definitely send them to the that queue, and that length becomes the new current minimum length. Mm -hmm. or at least I thought that would be our candidate for who, who, where to go. Now, the question is, what happens if we find another queue that's the same length as our current minimum? Well, we're going to flip a coin. If it comes up heads, we'll send the customer to the other queue. Otherwise, we'll keep them where they are. So that sort of randomizes it. It's not going to be a uniform random distribution. For those of you who remember your statistics, it's not going to be uniformly distributed, but it, there is an element now of randomness about which queue they're going to send them to. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to find the minimum length of the queue, the minimum, the shortest queue, and which queue are they going to enter? So at the moment, we're going to set it to queue zero given again that they're getting numbered zero to n minus one. And let's just presume that this is the minimum one and this is the one that they're going to enter. That way, if we have only one Q, we're guaranteed that we've got the right answer. If there's only one, that's the one they're going to. No problem. Now we're going to go through all of the Qs again. If the length of the Q is less than the minimum length, then this is the queue that they're prob probably going to enter. And now that's the new minimum length. Otherwise, what happens if it's exactly the same length? Then what we'll do is we'll generate a random number that's 0 or 1. If the random integer is a 1, heads or tails, then we're going to say, fine, that becomes the queue that they're going to enter. Otherwise, if they generate a 0, they do nothing. 
Now, what if it's not less than and it's not equal to the minimum length? Well, that means it's not the shortest Q, so we don't have to do anything. And I could make that explicit here. I could say else Q is longer than current minimum. Do nothing. Yeah. And now once we have that, now we can send the customer to the queue to enter. So this loop chooses which queue they should go into and which one is the minimum length. And if we have two of them or two or more queues that have the same length, we'll randomly decide whether we're going to move them to that other one or keep them where they are. And I'll leave it to you to figure out why that is not a uniform random distribution. Okay. But it doesn't matter. We just want it random. Okay. Now, the other way we could have done it is we could have said, okay, let's find the minimum, minimum the queue that has the minimum length. And then whichever one we found last, that's the one we send them to. Or whichever one we found first, let's send them to that one. You don't have to make it random. Yeah. Um, I uploaded this to you. I think I will upload this today also. Okay. Other questions about the Q project? They'll probably come up while you're doing lab today. So while you're doing the lab, go ahead and um, ask me. You know where to find me. And stop sharing. And did you have any questions, uh, Fung Kang? I'm going to stop recording now. <laughs>